well, someone's got to know what they're talking about instead of just me ranting and raving because I just want to go crazy. But anyway, welcome to the Mike and Doug show. I'm Doug. Hi, Mike. Hello, Doug. How are you today? Well, I'm wearing all black because it's a dark day for American jurisprudence. Just when mm. I think that we have made a step or two forward, I talk to someone like you, and though we don't give legal advice, uh, once you've been in the court system fighting it for 20 years like you have, you know a lot of stuff. So today, I'm going to be giving a very radical view of what I think about the jurisprudence system in America, and you are going to be giving facts, and we're going to start off with Chevron deference, which to me... <clears throat> at first looked fantastic. I rejoiced. I thought it was great until I read the bottom line. So tell us a little bit about Chevron deference decision by the Supreme Court. Yes, I'm a, I'm a particular victim of that Chevron deference as it relates to the Patent Office, because the Patent Office loved that case, and they created a whole patent trials and appeals board to essentially create this uh, separate court in the executive office of the director of the patent office where they could hear patent re-examinations. And, and who would have thought, you know, you get a patent, it's issued to you, it's a property right. And then all of a sudden, these deep pocketed um, attackers can come in and challenge your patent and force the patent office to re-examine your patent as if you never did it, as if you never paid, went through that uh, 30 months and, and uh, millions of dollars in trying to get your patent. And then all of a sudden they can just keep churning the, the, the legal mill to uh, attack you until such time as you get a corrupt uh, patent office director by the name of David J. Capus Jr. And he uh, pr proceeds to invalidate your, your patent as he is moving out the door to his uh, next law firm. And that's exactly what happened in Leader v. Facebook to us uh, in, re in regard to our patent. They used a Chevron court within the patent office to invalidate not only the claims that we challenged Facebook on in a parallel trial in the state of Delaware, but they also invalidated all, all the others. And so all 34 claims in our first patent were uh, were invalidated according to uh, this uh, special court that only pretends to follow due process. It's well, it's the, even a vague a vague pretense. Well, you have told us about this in the judicial system and particularly in the uh, patent office and the corruption going there. And it's they now just blatantly call it the administrative state, which equals the deep state, which equals. Right. The shadow government, which equals a bunch of permanent bureaucratic, unelected officials who cannot be fired, usually uh, led by senior executive service appointees who cannot be fired. We saw that with Andrew McCabe. So the administrative state basically was overruling the courts. But then again, I have no confidence in the courts. I just spent the morning and a little bit of yesterday reviewing a lot of these cases and when it comes down to it, these are the biggest spin of lies I've ever seen. Go to Wikipedia and plug in J6 and read it, and you will not believe the lies that have been spun around this case and the way that we have heard nothing about it. There are 1,260 people who were prosecuted. 450 of them are supposedly in jail. But think about it. How many of those people have you seen on the news? How many of those cases have ever been reported by the news? How many of the families have said a word about the 450 people who are locked up and the 1,200 people who have been prosecuted? You don't hear a word, except for the CIA provocateurs, who, as we know, with Liz Cheney's um, house investigation, which then recommended all these people for prosecution. Then it went to the DC Circuit Court. And what happened with that? Oh, that was insane. So we're going to talk a little bit about that because that's one of the most prevalent ones. But with Chevron, what is important to remember is what you pointed out first. The Supreme Court may have said, uh, shame on you, administrative state. You don't have the right to interpret laws 
on your own. You're unelected officials. You are people who can't be fired. You are extremely biased uh, politicians who are, in many cases, basically bought off by corporations. The bottom line is everything in the past that was determined by these this administrative state and these administrative decisions are swept under the rug and can no longer be brought forward. In other words, it's like the Hunter Biden uh, laptop. And I, might, and I might add, the people that have been damaged by those bogus cases can't even appeal. Which is astounding. Now, we've seen this so many times. And the problem is, is that with Trump, you don't know whose side he was really on when he said he wanted the, all the people to join uh, basically a, a demonstration in Washington, D.C. to say that the election was corrupt, which if you don't think the elect election was corrupt, then you haven't done any homework whatsoever. But if you look at the decisions of the courts, even though some of them support the fact that it was a corrupt and fraudulent election, nothing has happened. So with Chevron, this is basically bad news. This is not good news. Yeah. It, it, Chevron was a terrible case. And every time they tried to fix it in appeals that were heard at the Supreme Court, they made it worse until, uh, until now. Now that's the logic. That's the, that's the way it's presented right now. But here's my problem with it from the standpoint of the Supreme Court. Did it take the, this long to really figure out that the idea of having administrative courts that had pretend judges and pretend proceedings that they defined themselves that weren't even a part of anything that Congress uh, defined uh, could get together and they could reinterpret the laws that govern them till they got them twisted around uh, so that those who uh, for whom they are in their pockets uh, could get the, the result they're looking for. That's exactly what happened to us. I have intimate knowledge of how this she the Chevron case was abused at the patent office. And it's even worse than that because as we have now discovered, the patent office is actually run by British Serco under contract for patent examinations. And therefore these administrative courts all committed fraud in not disclosing to every party that they are taking orders from the city of London. I mean, it's, it's, it, and with the J six case, that's a little bit different uh, opinion because they were, they were arguing over the definitions of, of several sections of a statute in, in re, with regard to what obstruction meant. And uh, I, I get the argument. Uh, and it, I also can see in the, uh, the argument that was made by the, the losing party that that was just a bunch of lawyers uh, all impressed with their uh, ability to take, make silk purse out of a sow's ear. And so they made an argument that sort of sounded legitimate because there is a rule that if attorney brings a frivolous case before a court, uh, they can be sanctioned and, and disbarred. Uh, so you've got to make enough effort to do that now with the uh, with the uh, uh, other case, the uh, Gateway Pundit case uh, with uh, the First Amendment, that's another example of a bunch of lawyers on Gateway side and several states involved and some individuals where the lawyers just didn't do a good job. They didn't make a, the, a, an argument well enough to even try to prove what they were asserting related to uh, Facebook's cooperation with the federal government in censoring COVID-19 and election rigging uh, conduct on the Facebook platform. They, they did a terrible job. Now, uh, we, we may be bouncing around here, but it's all the same thing. Let's go back to patents. First off, the Chevron deference case demonstrates that you, Michael McKibben, and every citizen has no right to any property. I just got the taxes on our house. If I can't pay the taxes, I lose the house. The government takes it, okay? So think of that. I never own my house. I have to pay taxes. And if I don't pay the, uh, the taxes have raised so much, they, they just, these are administrators who decide to raise these things. These have nothing to do with laws. They have nothing to do with justice. 
but then when it goes before uh, a, a certain judges like Jack Smith, who the court recently, Supreme Court recently ruled that he actually had no jurisdiction. So the second you uh, uh, see someone appointed as a special counsel and a grand jury, it's corrupt. It's already decided. And it is to basically gather up evidence and then hide it. And that's what Jack Smith is doing. So Jack Smith, in his case, is trying to prosecute Trump for election interference. Well, that's completely ridiculous because they also call it insurrection. They also call it an attack. And the people who were prosecuted were prosecuted for dozens of different crimes, which none of them committed. And the real criminals were the provocateurs who we can see in even the films that Liz Cheney released, which she basically committed crimes by not allowing exculpatory evidence to come forward. Douglas, I need to take that break and, and uh, go deal with this uh, delivery. So basically what we're saying is we can dissect these cases and it will simply make you vomit to see the corruption. What this is called in general is lawfare. In other words, warfare in our judicial system. Yes. And who is the war against? Us, the citizens. Because as we know, the courts always protect their own kind in Washington District of Crime. And we can see what happens in these cases, you know, uh, just again and again. We can go down a list of thousands of problems with all of these cases that seem like sometimes on the surface they're really for the good of the people and they're constitutional. Look closely. In most cases, they're non-constitutional, unconstitutional, anti-constitutional, for instance. Well, you know, Douglas, there is a saying, uh, a broken clock is correct two times a day. <laughs> and I think that's what we have here. Every once in a while, somebody gets a bone thrown at them. Right. But if we look at the bottom line, for instance, what you were just talking about with patents, Americans have no right to property. I was just screaming this to my beautiful wife, Tyla, that, okay, a house that you buy for 200000 it's $10,000 in taxes a year. So you put it over 20 years and you just paid as much in taxes as you paid for the house. Yeah. You never owned the house. Oh, plus all the services of trash, sewage, water, electric, the road, you're taxed, 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 and taxed. So you're quadruply taxed on almost everything in America and really technically you have very few rights, and we've seen that in the way that some of these court cases have gone. And Trump, for some reason, seems to be a beautiful example of the can of worms that the judicial system is. And your case is the linchpin, leader versus Facebook, is the linchpin that could, in fact, return free speech to America and perhaps some begin some justice in our judicial system. Yeah, the, this, the Chevron case uh, was reading very well as I was reading through it. And then I got to the last paragraph and I discovered that Roberts wrote in there, and oh, by the way, this doesn't apply to any cases that went against a, a person because of the corruption of the Chevron decision. That was, that's a paraphrase. So... What he's saying is, okay, we just gave carte blanche um, immunity to all lawyers and judges in prior cases where they ruled that opposite of what we're ruling now because they ruled it before now. Now, I think that is uh, as good as it gets in terms of evidence of the corruption of our judicial system. But one of the things you haven't mentioned is the way these judges are compensated and how that compensation changed dramatically. Uh, and I just looked it up. I haven't pulled that record out lately. On March 14th of 2001, the Judicial Conference, um, including two of the uh, judges or clerks in our case, approved sweeping changes to how uh, judges have to report their holdings and mutual funds. And essentially what they did is they said, uh, we're going to call it the safe harbor concept. It's not a rule, it's not a law, it's not a policy, it's a concept. And in that concept, if you hold, uh, if you have 
let's say IBM coming before you in your court and the largest holding of a mutual fund like uh, Fidelity Contra Fund is in IBM, you don't have to disclose that uh, that IBM stock is within Fidelity Contra Fund under the safe harbor concept. So what we see is this collusion, no, conspiracy between the banks, the judges and the courts and, their, uh, and the judges uh, that says that this is the way we're going to compensate you going forward. We're going to give you these special tips of which mutual funds to go into so that you don't have to report that you are hearing a case uh, about a, a holding that you have a conflict in. And therefore, you don't have to tell the other side that you're secretly for IBM. You just, you just carry on your merry way. And if it ever comes up, and it has come up a number of times in a number of cases, these judges all run back to this safe harbor concept from the judicial uh, conference in March 4th, 14th of 2001. Now, I have actual personal knowledge of this because our patent attorney at the time, J.P. Chandler, James P. Chandler, was advising this group, this judicial conference, on this particular policy because I just uh, looked it up in my notes. On March 28th, which would have been 14 days later, Chandler makes a bold statement to me, which was really weird. He said, I am not properly compensated for my value to America, and neither are judges. He said that 14 days later. You know, you and I have been going round and round about this for years, and I used to jump up and down, go crazy over lawfare and the warfare being used against Americans and in absolute defiance of the Constitution and the capriciousness of judges. Well, here's the deal. The judges are completely capricious. And now we find out that the administrative state, in other words, their um, judicial assistants, write rules that then are considered laws. Right. And they consider it an interpretation of the law. And that's what Chevron deference is. They defer the, the EPA laws to the judge and the capricious judge to just basically interpret it any way they want. Well, that depends upon how much money was put into their offshore account, whose side they're going to be on, or what stock they have. Look at all of these elected officials in Washington, D.C. after the second election, they oftentimes never leave and they stay there permanently. Well, we know that they're the worst, most despicable people on the earth. They're not being reelected. They're being selected. And we know this. We've proven this is a fact. So what happens? This is just an insider group method yeah. of using the courts to support their criminal activity. Yeah. The, if, we, if we recall, the number two top priority of the Pilgrim Society was the taking of control of the the supreme court uh the the empowering of the executive i.e monarch and then the taking control of the supreme court against anybody who was not favorable to the british empire and then we have watched them in their their attempt to replicate the queen's court or the king's court uh ever since then they ha have patiently been chipping away at the Constitution. And every time one of these decisions come, what we see is there's a lot of patience there, which is um, uh, one of the uh, things that's hard for people today who are in this give it to me and give it to me now uh, mentality can't understand about how slowly these people operate. They just keep chipping away at it, knowing that eventually if a case comes to the Supreme Court, they can turn it their way. But I think with Chevron, they saw an even better system. How many how many agencies are there? Something like seventeen. Um, there are actually fifty six official agencies, 56. but with their subgroups and subcommittees, it goes into the hundreds. Okay, so they allowed each of these agencies to replicate a court that handled policy for that particular agency, and I mean, talk about a a free for all in terms of. Uh, corrupt people. All they had to do was uh, g get their people on these administrative courts and they could twist and turn uh, the writings in the law any way they wanted. And they have done that. 
And now to the point where the Supreme Court has pulled back the reins and they're saying, this is corrupt. We can't do it this way anymore. Oh, but by the way, if you've been damaged, don't come to us. Now, let's just look at the executive branch. The judicial system, the Department of Justice works directly for the president. And he can write presidential directives and presidential letters and executive orders that affect the hundreds of agencies. Now, the Constitution only provides for federal agencies underneath the auspices of cabinet positions. Right. There are very few cabinet positions That's in relationship to the hundreds of agencies that now act completely with impunity, completely on their own, and they can turn around and make up rules. For instance, the Attorney General of New York ran on a platform of, I'm going to get Trump no matter what I have to do. Okay, So then what did she do? She had special investigators go and look at all of his financial records. Well, they had already done that when he ran for president. He completely opened all the books to them. They didn't find any problems then. Now, Judge Chutkin in New York has charged Trump and the most ridiculous fine I've ever seen in a court case for doing what everyone, every businessman in New York, especially New York City, does in terms of real estate and their assets, which are not determined by the person themselves, but by auditors. So why didn't the auditors get charged? Well, what they did is they made up a law after they investigated Trump's finances that would encompass, they, they, they made what he did illegal, they made a law to make it illegal, and then they charged him with that. Okay, what is that? That's warfare. That is right. lawfare. That is just the most incredible outright corruption that you can imagine. But we, as we look at it, we are influenced by what is called government by journalism or government by media propaganda. And right. so he, that was election interference. All of this is election interference on the part of the other side. And yet the judges don't do anything about it. For instance, the J6 case, all those cases, as you pointed out, because I read it and I didn't re read it carefully enough, I thought that the Supreme Court said, oh no, all the obstruction cases against the 1,200 people have been dropped down to um, trespassing. No, they haven't. As you pointed no. out, they've been remanded back to the d same stupid court that right. made their decisions and they now get to make new decisions based upon it. But if they, and, and they can't be, of course, with the new uh, Chevron uh, deference, they can't be sued for what they do. And I also used to jump up and down saying this should be illegal. We should impeach these judges. And you just laughed at me today saying this, there's going to be no impeaching of judges. You must be kidding. That's not going to happen. Why don't we recall everyone in Washington, D.C.? Because the selection process, which is all fraudulent with the electronic election machines, Optech, the software that's in them. Uh, Gavin Newsom was recalled. Not to mention the uh, election winning template that Hillary paid for during our case. Which is, of course, election uh, corruption and fraud. And we then they charge Trump with that because his followers want to say, yes, Mike Pence, all of the alternate electors from the state, and there were many of them, cause you to have to follow the law. The law is as if there are alternative electors sent from that state, from the because the state government is in charge of elections. If just the fact that one single elector said that they were filing because he they believed that there was fraud and that the real election went to Trump. What did they do about that? Nothing. They even set up the J6 supposed uh, insurrection. Uh, that was Pelosi. Uh, Trump said, bring in the National Guard. Read Wikipedia. It says that he refused to allow the National Guard to come in. He wasn't in charge of that to begin with. She's in charge of the Capitol Police. Look at the films. The Capitol, the building was locked up because there was so many people out there yelling for Trump. And what did they do? They opened it up and invited them in. They took down the barriers. The, the, the Capitol Police would have to also be charged. And you know that they charged, they, they said that woman was shot. She's not been shot and killed. The issue with J6 is, yeah, they've remanded the case to the lower courts, 
for a, a number of different claims and they've made a clear opinion on this one but this is not the only one and so the question is do these lower courts have any appetite for continuing this charade on and they probably do well we got to see with the missouri ca case of um uh, murphy uh, versus missouri that for public opinion these cases look as if they are really sincerely concerned about justice but then as you pointed out the lawyers who brought this case didn't do any homework, and it was a it was a fait accompli before it even went to the court. Right. They 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 did not make a good case for what they were asserting, and uh, you know so therefore, I really can't fault this opinion the way it's read. It's very detailed. It's discussion of one word otherwise, and what it means in a law and. <clears throat> What are the different contexts and 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 it, it's a real it's a real uh, um, it'll put you to sleep reading it. Uh, but in the end, they they I think they correctly interpreted that clause and said because of that, the um, the people who are attacking the J six people are overreaching in their interpretation and therefore they rejected it. Okay, fine, they rejected it, but they didn't they didn't completely close the door on it. They they, uh, they, what's the word? They um, vacated. They vacated one of the claims, but there are other claims there that they did not vacate and that the lower court has to take up. So I don't think these J6ers are off the hook. And I, anybody that would summarize that uh, is looking for sensational headlines because that's not what it says. But the headline said that the court system has no power to enforce the First Amendment. <laughs> Imagine that, that that's the headline and you go, well, what does that mean? Or let's take any of these cases. And as someone just pointed out to me, if we talk about these things, this uh, video could just be uh, knocked down because there is a new ruling uh, that from the Congress that the White House Biden administration has the right to go into any social media and stop the promulgation of anything that is against their administrative policies, which includes the jabs. It includes opinions about J6. It includes everything. So if you aren't part of agreeing with the administration. Well, I don't think that I don't I don't read it that way. But who am I? What I read is they did a very bad job of presenting their case and they could not uh, they could not rule for them because of the bad job they did. And from my earlier read of it, I would I would have to agree with them that uh, the um, I'm going to call it the gateway pundit uh, crowd, the, the plaintiffs, uh, they they argued based on an assumption, a, a fallacious assumption that Facebook even has right title and interest to the product that they're talking about and therefore have a duty in the property that they don't have right title and interest to, 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 to protect First Amendment rights in some way at all. They ought to be arguing that Facebook is a fraud and it's run by the government. And here we have the government attacking the government in that case. So it's all messed up. It's, it's typical lawfare. It's all messed up. And so they could come out with any decision they want. So they picked a a specific issue of due process to hammer on to get it thrown out. And they weren't wrong, I don't see, in, in, in that part of the assessment. But obviously, the, the, the greater issue is these plaintiffs now all have egg on their face because they did a really poor job of, of framing the argument. Well, it's kind of like the Hunter Biden case to me. Uh, they charge him with a very small crime. But then they gather all four of the laptops, put them into the FBI evidence room so that they can never be seen again. And if and so all the crimes that are on those laptops have now been swept under the rug. He was convicted with a very small crime. Now he is basically an advisor to his dad in the White House. And it just so happens that they keep finding bags of cocaine sitting around everywhere. OK, so this is what we're working with here. We're working with the fact that there's not much you can do. For instance, when Trump brought his case uh, before the Supreme Court, they said he had no standing. 
So the president of the United States has no standing in the Supreme Court to say that he noticed all the fraud in the election. But read Wikipedia. It'll tell you that they were all trumped up cases. It was all nonsense. And that uh, Rudy Giuliani and um, uh, Sidney Powell and all those people, well, they were convicted down in Georgia in one case. But then we find out that the pr prosecutor uh, was conflicted and was, in fact, in a conspiracy against all those people. But it oh, doesn't overturn the case. That? Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I do have a problem with that because, unfortunately, I'm so stupid. I still believe that America might have justice in the court systems. But exactly. as of now, as of the recent cases that we have seen, you look closely and you have to wonder what in the world is going on. How come Trump didn't know when he called everyone to Washington, D.C., that Pelosi wouldn't allow the National Guard to come in, wouldn't right. allow the Capitol Police to do anything about it, invited all those people in, and then called them an insurrection. And really, it was nothing more. It wasn't even trespassing. Look at the films. The Capitol Police opened the barriers, invited them in, opened the doors from the inside because they were locked. And, it, and then the people breaking out the windows, the only real crimes that were done, well, those were the provocateurs. Right. And we now know that no. the CIA has infiltrated the um, the Proud Boys and all the groups that they said were these far right wing radicals. No, 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 no. Look closely. That's not who was there. Just like in Charlottesville, that's not who led those. That's why they, th those marches and the riots, they had masks on. And they all are very, very fit young men, all with very short haircuts and they fit the bill of being FBI agents instead of. Well, that's exactly what it, it sounds like. It Because I talked to an Orthodox priest last week who was at J6. He was down listening to Trump's speech. And he said down there, the atmosphere was, was very positive. There were people with their kids and their babies. And it was just a family event. And then he said before Trump was even done speaking, he said a whole group of people at the front of the audience just left and walked away. And he said he liked it because he could get closer to the, the podium. Uh, but then uh, after the speech was over and they were starting to walk up, they heard all this commotion at the Capitol. And of course they didn't know what it was. And, and uh, by the time they got there, uh, all the main events that we now know well uh, were done. And uh, he did indicate that there were certain people there that he said were not your typical family outing type people. And they were they were very obvious. And I think that's who you're talking about, these FBI plans. And the FBI is allowed to do that, by the way. They're allowed to play games and, and fake people out and, and uh, deceive people. Didn't you know that's a part of their charter? In my opinion, anytime you give someone a plea deal, that's breaking the law. Any time that you use a star witness in a grand jury and you never reveal who the person making the accusation is and to the person who's being accused, that's against the law. That's because the queen and the queen's court made that a rule. These are star that's, chambers. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to regularize all of our judicial conduct in the U.S. with the uh, inner temple crown court uh, in the city of London. I, I can name so many cases. Uh, the new case against P. Diddy. What is it, 36 or 56 charges against him in New York, but now it's become a federal grand jury trial? That means that P. Diddy was the, um, he was basically an operative for the enemy who was collecting blackmail exactly like Epstein Island, you know? And we have yet to see the list of all the people who went there. What did uh, Bill Gates went there? 37 times. And when asked, he says, I don't know what was going on that island. 37 times he went there, a tiny island, but he didn't know anything oh, that was going on there. I thought he was a smart guy. He went to Harvard. Come on. Well, of course, you see, these are the, this is the fake news. And now we find that we have fake justice and we have a fake Congress and a fake Senate and a fake White House. Since the time of Jimmy Carter, it has been a complete farce of fraud. I and say the, before, way before Jimmy Carter, but Oh, I yes. Point. But I mean, uh, in terms of, um, remember, BCCI, which is the CIA, was the number one financial supporter of Jimmy Carter's campaign. I mean, come on. You want to talk about election interference? 
Uh, and as you pointed out, the template to win the election that Hillary used hired a foreign uh, person in India to create a program that basically was propaganda that was perfectly legal because in the National Defense Authorization Act of Obama, it said that all Americans are basically essentially considered war actors until proven otherwise, and we can propagandize against them and that the White House can stu stuff their administrative policies down the mouth of everyone else with lies. It's perfectly legal for a senator or a member of the House of Representatives to lie. They can lie during these congressional supposed kangaroo courts. Uh, for instance, Liz Cheney, nothing but lies, nothing but lies. She only showed the parts of the film which were not damning. The, the, the parts of the film that they showed from J6 were not damning. I watched every minute of it. They showed that the I police saw. invited them in. Exactly. Exactly. They were just touring around. And now and they were being that they weren't even being rowdy. They weren't doing anything and they weren't destroying documents. So it wasn't obstruction of anything. They, they, this was simply a peaceful demonstration until the provocateurs started breaking out windows. Right. Now, how about the two pipe bombs, right? I love it. They said that an officer was killed. No, he wasn't. They never gave the name of that officer. Another officer had a heart attack and they blamed that on the crowd. And I love this one. Three or four months later, uh, three officers committed suicide and they blamed that on the insurrectionists. And mm -hmm. they called it an insurrection when now the Supreme Court calls it trespassing, but only in the case of Officer Fisher, who had entered, in, uh, did he even enter? I don't even know if he entered into the Capitol. And so his case was the only case that was really listened to. And so they downgraded this. Well, hello, that was years ago this happened. Why would they do that now? Because they had to cover. They had to cover for Liz Cheney and the kangaroo court that they conducted that then recommended uh, 1,250 some people to the DOJ for prosecution. That is one of the first times I've ever seen a recommendation to the DOJ for criminality that they actually acted on it. What about Andrew McCabe, who took the five Clinton Foundation cases and basically swept them under the rug? No prosecutions, no determinations. He was found to be, uh, he lied. He lied uh, to the Congress. He lied to everybody. And then the, he got fired, but then he brought another case. And because he's a se uh, senior executive service member, he got his full retirement. So when you're a criminal, you have standing in the court. When you're someone who's just a citizen, you, you usually don't even have standing. And if you don't know the ins and outs of the laws, and now I used to scream and yell about this. When you go before a judge, if you don't have a lawyer, you are expected to know all pertinent laws in relationship to your case. But you didn't know the administrative rules, which are going to be the things that convict you. And who made those administrative rules? Just some flunkies, some the unelected administrators. Flunkies. Yeah. And, and they're permanent administrators. This is the permanent bureaucratic state, what we call the shadow government. It needs to be ended. But at the same time, we need to bring back recall. We need to recall every single person who voted for the non-constitutional um, Ha all Hazards and Pandemic Act and uh, ratified it five times. Every one of them committed a crime. They committed treason. They gave away our sovereignty to not even non-governmental agencies. The World Health Organization now rules the world. Yes. And when they passed the new rule, the, they wanted to pass a treaty that would then give the head of the World Health Organization, the United Nations, complete control of every single country. And it didn't pass. What did they do? They stuck in some amendments which were the same thing, and somehow those passed. Well, then the people who voted on it must have really been boondoggled because why would they vote for amendments that were the same as the treaty that they were standing against? Well, you know, one of the things that, uh, when you look at the resumes of these people over a decade like we have, uh, some patterns start to develop. And one of the patterns with the attorneys is they all seem to be specialists in constitutional law. And you think, wow, that's that's probably good. But no, it's bad because what they're learning is all the loopholes throughout the law that they're taught from uh, more senior criminals who teach them how to pass it down. And so what I do think is that this is another element of proof 
that the grifting system that the bankers set up to protect themselves pays the the white shoe lawyers uh, big bucks to to uh, maintain their hold over the judicial system so none of their people will ever get caught or if they get caught they'll get off in some way or another uh, given enough time and that, that frustrated the heck out of me to uh, be told uh, when we were doing our patent case that it was going to be at least three years of preparation before we went to trial three years that's a lot of time in one's life and then another two or three years for appeals so what we've got is a system that eventually rewards the crooked elements in our system and until i think the dynamics of that uh, mechanism are completely dismantled and reorganized. I don't think it's going to change at all. No. And that statute of limitations arises when you say that. Because how many, Eric Holder and what he did, the crimes he committed, he went quiet when he was pro, when he uh, was accused of all those things. But the day after the seven years rolled around and the no longer a statute, the statute of limitation was then in effect, he then came out and started to become as evil as he was before. So they know the rules. We don't know the rules. They have standings because they're, they've made their vows to the British Bar Association, to the Temple Bar, to the London uh, Pilgrim Society. That's that, how they got their Esquire designations. Which is, of course, non-constitutional. You can't have a title of any sort, an aristocratic title or anything granted by the British and be an American. Matter of fact, I wonder why we even allow dual citizenship in America, because in my understanding, right. every dual citizen I know is a criminal. While, yeah, we're, you, on, while we're on the subject of Supreme Court treachery, can you say something about this Murphy v. Missouri case, Mike, about the social media that these private companies can censor at our First Amendment rights? Oh, right. I mean, this, well, this, this is so egregious. Yeah, this, this Murphy case, uh, they were complaining that, uh, actually, this is the Gateway Pundit Group, uh, was complaining that uh, whenever they mentioned COVID, they were getting censored. And uh, on Facebook, primarily, that's what this subject was about. And so they were saying that you can't do that. Facebook can't do that, blah, 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 blah. And uh, to me, this is one I mentioned earlier, the whole premise of their argument is wrong. Because first of all, you're making an assumption that Facebook is a legitimate company. It is not. It is now proven that it was created and funded by the intelligence world and uh, DARPA and uh, uh, people associated with Five Eyes and the British. That's who created it. So it, it, it's a government entity. And so we're calling on a government entity. He is, this case is, uh, to protect free speech because it's taking down information that our government doesn't want us to hear or it's not fitting their narrative. Well, what's wrong with that story? We're talking about the government censoring itself or uh, correcting itself in, in, a, in a case where the government controls both sides of this argument. We, there's no way this can go anywhere but down. <clears throat> Thought analogy. I'm a civil engineer. And one of the things you notice is that sometimes when people pour the asphalt in a parking lot, it looks great for a number of years. And then all of a sudden, all these alligator cracks start occurring in the, in the asphalt. Now, the average layman thinks, well, okay, it needs another layer of asphalt. So sometimes they order it, they come in and they put another layer of asphalt on top of this. <clears throat> and then the alligator cracking uh, appears again within a few years. And so what's the issue there? Well, the issue is the contractor who built the parking lot did not put enough uh, number of inches on the aggregate underneath it. So they probably only put three or four when they should have put six or eight. And so the, the problem is, as long as we are observing the alligator cracks and making assumptions about what that means, which I think is what Gateway Pundit's doing, they're making the wrong argument. The argument is the legitimacy of Facebook 
and how can a illegitimate government entity uh, have any say at all in the free uh, First Amendment free speech when they're controlling both sides of that argument? They had their chance with the Commerce Act, Section 320, to say that social media can or cannot squelch free speech. Well, basically right now they can. They can squelch any free speech they want, and there's been a new law passed by the Congress. I think it went through the Senate. I they usually hide that once it's uh, once they put forth a crazy law like that. They don't really tell you uh, whether it goes through the Senate and then gets signed by the president. But the new law is that the administration has the capacity to squelch anything they say is not they th they say is not the truth. Well, that's complete insanity. We well, know that the government has been overthrown and that we've never had independence even uh, after the American Revolution. We did not get independent from the British government and the Pilgrim Society and the globalists and the Serco and SES and the patent office and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, folks, America is falling headlong into its own grave uh, because every day, for instance, they just put forth a new proposal, a new possible law, and that's where the demons exist. They exist in the laws because they support the uh, platitudes, the lies of politicians. They support the specters of propaganda, and then they become demon laws, which then we are subject to, but they are not. Let's remember that everyone, every elected politician in Washington, D.C., was exempt from the vaccination and wearing masks. Let's yeah, remember that. Yeah, that, tell, that says everything. They knew what was going on. And, and now the, the protected groups, for instance, there is there's a proposal right now, which they want to make into a law, that says that if you say that the United States is a constitutional republic, it is a felony. What? Because they say it's a democracy. We are not a democracy. We have never been a democracy. The founders and now that we know did that not choose are democracy. The founders Correct. specifically did not choose a exactly. democracy. That was one of their choices. We so have, they're just trying to gaslight the public. Absolutely. But what it does is the imbeciles out there who have no brain because they've drank too much fluoride water, been beamed through with too much electromagnetic frequencies, 5G, the poisonous food, so on and so forth, they can't think anymore. And so when they hear these things, all they hear is the headline. And so the headline basically said, these people are awful for saying we have a constitutional republic and it's a democratic government. No, it is yeah. not, but Democrat and democratic sound very similar. So if they can get them to pass a law saying we're a democratic uh, government and a nation, then basically it just supports the far left. If you and believe it, the lie. If you believe the lie long enough, it becomes the truth to you. And as they say, the bigger the lie, the easier it is to get people to, to uh, uh, believe it. Now we have these protected groups. There was just a law passed um, before that, some years ago, when we had Muslims uh, who used to be called terrorists. Remember when we were on a war against terrorism and now we're not? Even when, uh, for instance, 4,000 uh, people from Yemen have just been allowed into America by Biden for asylum. Yemen is in a war against everyone who goes through the Persian Gulf. They've been bombing us. They've been bombing Britain, British ships. They've been bombing everybody. And yet we allow 4,000 of them to be shuffled in and given more support than people who are on Social Security, Social Security disability, or our veterans. Yes, folks, they are given credit cards that and they're given places to live and they're given more benefits than citizens. Oh, and the new law, and this is a state law, but I believe that it's going to go into a federal law, that if a person, well, first off, they, they're fighting viciously to say that you have to um, basically have proof you're a citizen to vote. That's, of course, they fight that tooth and fang because here's the other law. There's a law, and I didn't look into it closely enough, but I read, read uh, the article and it said basically that I believe it was a certain state said that if, the, if an illegal, undocumented alien, who I call an invader, says that they believe they are a citizen, then they can vote. So if 
an invader identifies as a citizen, they wow. get to vote. This is where we're That's at, pathetic. folks. That it, is but pathetic. this is everywhere. How about the protected groups? How about Lord Pickle being able to decide what is anti-Semitism in America? He, he leads the committee, and right. the law was just passed. Well, there was a law previously passed that said that you that you cannot say anything bad about the protected group of Muslims, whether they're terrorists, where they're from, doesn't matter. It's just that they are a protected group. So, for instance, uh, some um, legislatures have put forth laws that say that if you misgender somebody, if I say that I'm a woman and you call me he, that's a felony. Okay? In no, other words, out for them. that's propaganda. Whatever you're projecting as your propaganda now has become law. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the people who say BS to this have no standing to well, even defend themselves in the court. Any normal person recognizes that that kind of that kind of behavior will eventually fail. And it looks like it's starting to fail because we can't rely on these these fake fake issues. There, there's so many fake issues right now, and they're just letting them all swirl and gaslight people whenever they want to. And I think that's to confuse them between the difference between truth and error. And uh, that's why I'm so uh, glad to be teamed up with you two in truth history, because in the end, the truths will last and those errors will fail. And uh, sometimes I guess we just have to wait them out. Wait them out. I used to say, well, let's just bring a lot of lawsuits against them, but those aren't doing very well. But my point here today is that Lawfare is using propaganda to make those who are standing for justice think that they're getting somewhere. For instance, let's look mm -hmm. at the Trump cases. Jack Smith, according to the Supreme Court's new ruling, has no standing to bring that case against Trump. A special investigator has to be already in an office to do the job that he is appointed to do. Well, Jack Smith is not part of the Department of Justice. He's not a judge. He, he's he's basically a complete imbecile, just and he's a private citizen, as they'll say. Same thing with Robert Mueller and his Russia, Russia, Russia case against Trump, which was, of course, a grand jury, which was, of course, fake, which basically took every single criminal that was involved in that. And we listed all the criminals. And the only place you're going to find anything else than us telling you who those criminals were was Robert Mueller's list of the people that he interviewed in this grand jury in a closed court with no witnesses and then exonerated all of them. None of them can be charged now. No, by the way, we discovered that he was very close to the Crown Prosecution Service in London. And, and the people, the main people involved with the Trump Russia hoax were associated with Mueller and with the Crown Prosecution Service. So there we have uh, the people that are really driving that agenda. Alison Saunders, who was the head prosecutor in Britain, came over and met with Bruce and Nellie Orr. Nellie worked for yep. Fusion GPS. We now know that uh, that the uh, the lawyers for the uh, Democratic National Convention committed crimes because they uh, perpetrated lies and brought uh, lawsuits, tried to say that Trump was breaking the law when they were the ones breaking the law. So that's what you do. You get a corrupt lawyer and they simply use the law against the law so that the people who should be exonerated yeah. are convicted and those who should be convicted are exonerated and permanently exonerated now because of Chevron deference says that Robert Mueller no longer can be prosecuted or that whoever appointed him could not be prosecuted now because that's in the past and we've, we're over that. Robert Mueller was a private citizen working for uh, some of the worst hedge funds, some of the worst uh, military industrial companies in the world, just like James Comey had worked for them before. And then after he yeah. got fired, he Comey didn't get prosecuted. Comey was HSBC. Yes. And uh, the Mellon... Uh, uh, yeah, that, the, Mellon, the Mellon Fund, the offshore account. Which gets with more... With a $10 million minimum. Best returns of any hedge fund in America, and that's where all of the people who work for the DOJ, FBI, CIA go afterwards, and they work for them. They don't do any work for them, but Optima, they get paid off. Optima Fund. Melon yeah, Optima. Fund. Melon Optimum Fund. So we, and I oftentimes forget to mention this, that 
that Michael and his researchers have, uh, for instance, with Severon uh, Deference, he's written uh, or put together and published on our side and on his side, Americans for Innovation and Aim for Truth, the evidence, the facts, but and you can read about this. So we're not just like so many of these people on the internet who just turn on their computer and just give you their opinion without any research and without any evidence. No, we have all the evidence to show what it is that we're talking about. Now, today we're talking in general about the way that our judicial system has been flushed down the toilet, but it was flushed down the toilet years ago, probably I'd say in the, uh, in uh, right after the American revolution, there were lawyers who said in the Par- Tre- Treaty of Paris that as long as Americans still owed a single British citizen any money or that they didn't get the price that they were supposed to be paid when, say, let's say a, a British loyalist had land in Florida, and this was the case with Disney, and this was a very famous case recently, uh, that that land is still owned by the British. So in other words, until we pay that land for that land to the people who say they own it, the Treaty of Paris is not in effect. And so the American Revolution was never won. And then the War of 1812, well, that was just the British coming in, trying to wipe us out and then setting up a federal system. And I say there should be no federal courts. And that, well, that think, of the agencies that exist, most of them should not exist, federal agencies. They well, should just still- think, think of the story of the Rothschilds. Now, we've all heard that. I, for the longest time in my life, thought that was just all conspiracy, had never really dug into it. But now I know the facts, and we know the facts for sure that the Rothschilds funded the Hessians and the British uh, in the in the war of uh, Rev- the, the Revolutionary War, and then they turned around and funded the British in the War of 1812, where they the British came back over and tried to take us again. That was the Rothschilds, and then all of a sudden they're okay because they gave J.P. Morgan money to to start. Uh, the Chase Bank in, in the United States, and they also put funds in Alexander Hamilton's first four banks that he formed as a treasury treasury secretary under George Washington. So, what is wrong with our mentality that we can say to ourselves, "Well, it's okay if the guy's funding our enemy as long as he gives us money"? That's the rule. What what kind of moral is that? So there's something that has been taken out of our psyche that when it comes to uh, the moral issues related to banking, for example, and the, and the Rothschilds, we just go blank. We just go numb. And so somebody says now that that's what they're doing with um, biowarfare. And that we now know from our research that in 1973, Lord Jacob Rothschild fund, uh organized a, a major British uh, hearing on on uh, technology, excuse me just a second, on technology, and then out of this findings of his group, uh, he started the, bio, the biotechnology industry on his own, by himself, and then 80% of the companies he invested in were American. So here we go again. We, who are the, if they're evil people that we should not be paying attention to, why are we taking their money and then excusing them no matter what their conduct is, conduct is? Because, Michael, we have a special relationship with the British, even though they don't have freedom. Ah, they're under a monarchy. They're under I a love system. British people. I love England. And I have many friends there. And uh, I would uh, go to bat for them any time. But the aristocratic a system in the in Britain needs to end. The United Kingdom has what 54 or 56 countries that are basically under their dominion and America is another one. It's just that we didn't know it. This is a secret one. But if you look closely you'll find that the British are at the bottom of every single one of these things. We don't the reason that we they can conduct a grand jury trial which should be illegal because you don't get to face the person who's accusing you. You don't get to question them. You don't get to have your lawyer in the courtroom with you. You can have them in the hall, but they're not there uh, in the court with you to defend you. And that the judge acts with unbelievable capriciousness. But, you know, look, go, go into family court. You want to talk about court? 
I have sat through so many hours of family court. And by the way, I have been in uh, criminal courts uh, hundreds, if not thousands of times because of my jobs that I've had. And what I see judges doing is the most despicable things I've ever seen in my whole life. They don't follow any rules. They follow whatever they want. And in the family court, it is unbelievable. You can't believe it until you see it. But now I'm believing it because I'm seeing even the Supreme Court, which is in fact nothing more than an, a British aristocratic system that is a monarchy. So we have now made our president right. the monarch. We've now made the Senate and the House the aristocrats. We've made the senior executive service members landholders with you know uh, titles like barons and esquires and so on and so forth. And so the people in government, and I don't just mean America, I mean all over the world, the leaders of the world are actually the biggest criminals on the face of the earth. And in many cases, the most despicable and debauched individuals that you can possibly ever imagine. But we Americans, we have no standing. Go ahead. I tried to defend myself, pro se. Is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. I tried to defend myself in the court. Holy moly. They pulled out laws and rules and ways to manipulate me that no matter who I talked to, there was no way I could have ever won my court case. And then the judge basically literally looked at me and said, I don't like you. And this isn't going to go well for you. And the first minutes of the court case. And for instance, with the family court, my four children's names were never brought up ever. They never once considered the children, which is what it's supposed to be all about. All they wanted to do is make sure the lawyers got paid for their hourly wages and they got a That's lot of hours. Uh, priority in. number one. And then eventually the lawyer told me, cause I found uh, an honest lawyer. It was really hard. I had to go through dozens, but he said to me, look, Doug, this is all a game. If they write a letter, they want me to write a letter back. Well, that's going to cost you $1,000 for every letter, and the letter doesn't move you forward. Here's the bottom line. Anytime you go into court and your lawyers refuse to sit down with the other side and construct an agreement outside of the court, then they are, in my opinion, criminal lawyers just trying to fleece you for your money. Exactly. It, it's as simple as that. And you saw that. This How much money did you spend defending leader technologies? $10 million. Yeah. And you didn't win, but you did win because in 11 of 11 cases, they said you were right. But, oh, you still didn't win in the long run because the bottom line is the they Supreme made up, Court they made had, up evidence. They had stock in Facebook. Right. They couldn't let you win. That would cause their stocks to go down. And why is it that every permanent politician comes out having tens of millions of dollars? Do we... This is beautiful. Do you know that Joe Biden, did you see this recently? They, they said, how can a family that's supposed to be upright and just, and they claim he's so wise and he's so just and he's so kind, have hundreds of LLCs hiding their business, hundreds of bank accounts, which were never, ever, ever told, and he's supposed to report those things. Look at Obama. He had like a dozen aliases. He never reported it. Look. You can't hardly find anyone. This is the British way. It's the British way because you cannot convict an aristocrat the, uh, because they call a star chamber and you don't even get to know who is accusing you of these things. And and look, look at this. Look at Wade versus Roe. Look at Chevron deference. Look at all these new Supreme Court decisions. Why are they bringing up their prior judgments? then if those previous Supreme Court justices were wrong, why didn't we impeach them? Why didn't we convict them of treason for their anti-constitutional attacks on the American citizens? Yeah, this was one of the things that was kind of suspicious about the Chevron decision in Gorsuch's uh, support of the decision. He spent, I was going to go back and count, but I bet half of his discussion was what English law had to say about Chevron issues as it related to American law. Why would he be spending, we don't have enough precedent in the US, why would he be spending all that time going back that far? Well, if your job is to line up your decisions with the King's Court, then this was a good decision for the King's Court. And I think that's what he was doing. Whether it's Israel, Ukraine, North Korea, Russia, 
China, it doesn't matter. The British have gotten us into every modern war with false flags and the Five Eyes Agreement where they we believe what their intelligence agencies tell us, and it's all fake. But look at Israel. Let's remember the queen owns a large portion of Jerusalem. I mean, the king now, the British monarchy owns a large portion of Jerusalem, but they're not getting involved in this war, are they? It could be the War of Armageddon, but they're too busy pulling up the oil out of the Mediterranean basin right off the shore of Palestine illegally and off the shore of Lebanon illegally, off the shores of Syria illegally, off the shores of Cyprus illegally, and they're pulling it all in so fast that they have to create a distraction. And then what do you get? You get Bibi Netanyahu already convicted of two felons for being involved in the um, the uh, taking over of the Golan Heights and giving it to Genie Oil, which those aren't even Israelis, <laughs> okay? And, and so what we see here is criminals like Zelensky in Ukraine and before him, uh, Poroshenko, and before him, the previous president, all of these people are 100% corrupted by mammon, by the demon of money. And this is so evident now. You can just follow yeah. it back. For instance, there's this meme that says, yes, if you really want to know, uh, it has been um, settled science that this is so. And what you do is you follow back who it is that gave them the money to make that decision, and then you'll understand why it's settled science. For instance, in all of climate the climate myth, the climate change myth, which of course was climate freezing and then climate heating and then climate change. It's changed over the years. It's always changed. Ozone depletion, so on and so forth. That is just a, uh, that is a smoke and mirrors because in the climate, uh, the, the um, uh, Rio de Janeiro climate um, environmental um ideas that were brought forward that are now uh, basically the attempt to create a carbon footprint that every human being has to pay a tax on their carbon footprint, never once refers to the sun, which creates all climate. Right. This is how bad it is that no one stands up for the truth whatsoever because they know, if they know the inside, they know that they will not be able to win. And, and, and by the way, I'm just going to point this out. The three or four policemen who committed suicide because of the terrible insurrection on J6. No, they didn't commit suicide. Those are probably the only honest officers that were coming forward to tell the truth. Okay? You don't commit suicide months later just because you were doing your duty as a policeman. No, that's completely silly and ridiculous. Oh, you mean Arkansas? Arkansas, yes. And, you know, I mean, just look at the Clinton Foundation. Who could be any more criminal than that? We have pointed this out again and again, and then they had Andrew McCabe. He would viciously go into anyone talking about the Clintons and take over the case when he became, when he took Comey's place as the as the head. And then he was convicted for uh, for all of his lies and lying before Congress, lying before everybody, Nothing happens. This I just is saw him on CNN last night. The biggest criminals in the world, after they don't get charged, and we all see their crimes, become mainstream media, media pundits. Okay? If you believe Clapper, if you believe Carvel, if you believe Brennan, if you believe Comey, I'm sorry. So here we are proving... There's no hope for you. Proving that W.T. Stead was prescient in that he said government is driven by journalism and he proved that himself uh back in the day uh in his editorials within his uh, newspapers he noticed that uh, all the churches for example would would publish their sermons in his newspaper every week and then he noticed when he put an editorial in that everybody quoted his editorial and forgot about what the preachers said and over time, he realized, hey, the power is in journalism. It's not in religion or, or morality or anything else. So he started pursuing that, and he pursued that with Cecil Rhodes. And it was Cecil Rhodes that gave him, at that time, uh, my machine. So what we're saying, folks, is when you see headlines about judicial decisions, don't believe it. 
read to the bottom line, as Michael just pointed out, and you will see that it's the opposite of what you think it is. This is simply political prostitutes using the judicial system for lawfare to support the criminals and to make sure that they have glazed over with propaganda what it is that they've done as their crimes. And if you think that a certain decision has gone a, a, a good direction, like with Hunter Biden, no, the thousands of crimes of Hunter Biden were just swept under the rug. And now he's a White House advisor that we know that the entire Biden family has taken money from China, from Russia, from Ukraine, and basically everyone, just as Hillary took money for the Clinton Foundation from 125 nations when she was the Secretary of State. That's the corruption that we're dealing with here. It's ancient, it's old, it goes back to Babylon and the bankers. It went through the Vatican and um, uh, the laws that the, Vaticans have cre uh, that the Vatican created, which then were supposed to be the superior laws, even over national laws or what kings and queens and monarchs would say. And so now what are we being ruled by? The same old corrupt British monarchy that has basically been the defilement of the world and America is not free, folks. And don't look to the court systems to defend you because basically you have no standing because you're not an esquire and you don't understand the system of aristocracy and the system of the American monarchy, which is nothing more than another dominion of the United Kingdom.